Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the fall edition of the Totten Slam series, organized by the Air Lab, led by Professor Sebastian Scherer, and the Robot Perception Lab, led by Professor Michael Kayes at the CMA Robotics Institute. After tremendous response to our first series, we're glad to be back with a stellar lineup of speakers who will be touching upon a diverse set of topics. To kick things off, today we have Professor Frank Deller joining us to talk about factor graphs for perception and action. Frank Deller is a professor in the School of Computer. Uh, interactive computing at Georgia Tech and is also a research scientist at Google AI. Before joining Georgia Tech, Professor Frank was a fellow Tartan himself, obtaining his PhD from CMU School of Computer Science. Apart from his role at Georgia Tech, he has also led projects at Facebook and Skydio. Professor Frank's research lies at the intersection of robotics and computer vision, with the main focus being to design graphical models and techniques to solve large scale problems such as mapping, 3D reconstruction, and model predictive control. The very famous GT SAM toolbox embodies many of his research group's ideas. We are thrilled to have Professor Frank joining us today and look forward to the fun talk. The floor is all yours, Professor Frank. Thank you. All right, I'll share my screen. And then you can kill my video because I think the video is, should be visible on the slide. All right, so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm. I'm uh, we're always very happy to come back to, to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, in fact, I was in, in Pittsburgh a couple of weeks back because my daughter is, um, is starting a job at, um, in Pennsylvania. So we flew into Pittsburgh and visited the campus and we didn't see anyone, but it's good to see you virtually here. So um, excellent. Yes, I will be talking about factor graphs uh, for perception and action. Um, and let me just dive right into it. And I always like to start with with, um, with Skydio, the story of Skydio, uh, because because it's really most of, one of the most fun and impactful things I, I have done with with um, with the work that my students and I built actually. So I, I helped this startup called Skydio um, to build really the most advanced flying AI on the planet. And it, this is a, a screenshot of the, the first Skydio drone. And it's, uh, it's special because it has 12 navigation cameras. So it has a full 360 field of view of the environment around it. This was the first uh, commercially available uh, drone. Uh, since then, they've moved on to the Skydio 2, um, which has the same 360 field of view, um, but now only with only six very wide angle cameras that you can see on the, on the top of the drone. And there's a another triplet on the bottom. Uh, so they provide trinocular stereo in a full 360 configuration, which is, which is quite amazing. Um, with this, uh, you can make cool movies of you doing sports. And, and I encourage you to go to the Skydio website and see how awesome this is as a product. It, it uh, flies in unknown environments, avoids obstacles, plans movie, uh, you know, trajectories, um, it can track the people, uh, it can track a specific person. So it's really just an amazing uh, autonomous uh, device. And to deliver value for a customer, um, not just a Skydio drone, but any autonomous vehicle has to solve problems of both perception and action. And, and so I will be talking about uh, perception. So here you could see uh, an example from early, uh, footage I've shown several times before of, of one of the cameras uh, tracking features and from that um, deriving the, um, the trajectory and a sparse slam map around the vehicle. And that geometry en enables it to build a, a dense 3D map and also plan uh, the action in which, which in this case is centered on, on following um, the customer who's, who's, uh, who's, who's doing cool stuff, right? Like mountain biking or skiing or, you know, even water skiing these days. So, um, so that's sort of, of a motivation and, and, and other autonomous systems are equally motivating, uh, autonomous cars, autonomous spacecraft, autonomous flight. Um, and I have a particular view on, on the, on technology on how to do that. Uh, this is not going to be a deep learning talk. This is going to be a very classical robotics talk uh, about factor graphs. 
And so I'll dive a little bit into why factor graphs. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about factor graphs for, for perception, but mostly I'm going to focus on factor graphs for action because I, you know, and this is the slam, uh, a slam seminar, but um, I, I want to tell you how you can use the same technology that was so successful and popular in, in slam and navigation and use it for action, which is the other half of the robotics story, okay? So why factor graphs? Well, the reason I like factor graphs, which I discovered, factor graphs have been, you know, in, rediscovered in many different fields. Um, I like factor graphs because a lot of the problems that we face in robotics can be can be um, represented as a factor graph, so from from tracking a person uh, from the drone to estimating uh, maneuvers. So if you add um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit in more detail about what factor graphs are, but you can, you can estimate maneuvers, you can do optimal control, you can do mapping uh, and slam, and you can do 3D reconstruction of, of environments, all with the same graphical language um, that endows a lot of intuition to, to the problems that you're trying to solve. So, a lot of these problems are actually optimization problems with locality, and that's that's the key property that's that's captured by these factor graphs. So, so this is an animation by Michael Michael Case, who is of course at CMU. Um, and so, um, if you have a robot and it's seeing a landmark, you can you can introduce a variable for the robot and a variable for the landmark, and a factor that it, that captures the the relationship between the robot at that time step and the landmark at that position. Um, and so you can make this robot move and then there is a factor associated with its odometry and then there is um, you know, maybe a, a loop closure. And so you build this graph, which is very sparse, okay? Um, and, um, and this sparsity is going to be the key to, to, to uh, fast computation. And Factor graphs are, are beneficial, but even if you don't think about performance, they're beneficial. Uh, in, in, in many of the uh, applications and, and, and projects that I've been involved with, factor graphs served as a, a lingua franca, a, a whiteboard device by which we could uh, talk with a variety of different people. And I missed that interaction very much in this, uh, in this time. Um, about the problems that we're facing, what the variables are, what the factors are, what the structure of the graph is. And so, so maybe that is the key um, benefit of using a graphical model is really about talking with your colleagues, okay? So how, you know, we did a lot of things with this for perception and I wanna highlight some of my, my uh, recent, more recent students uh, work as well. Um, but I, I have to show this little uh, um, animation every time I give a talk. This is, this is from the, our very first papers on, on, on using factor graphs. This is a robot uh, walking in, in the world and the factor graph associated with it, it is a slam factor graph. So we, we would like to know both the uh, location of the robot and the location of the landmarks over time. And this factor graph is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a matrix, which is the Jacobian of the system. Um, so that's a derivative, okay? And so um, you can do gradient descent or, or a more sophisticated um, uh, optimization method, such as Gauss-Newton or levin markport to then solve for the optimal location of the robot and the landmarks given all the measurements. And we like to use more sophisticated uh, optimization methods and gradient descent because, and we can, because we don't have that many parameters. Um, so I want to contrast this with deep learning. Deep learning is also a graph, a computation graph for which you compute the derivatives, i.e. the Jacobian, or in, the, in their case, the gradient, because the Jacobian is going to be too large and it's going to be too dense. And so that's why in, in in deep learning, typically the only option is to do gradient descent, but in, in SLAM and in navigation, uh, we can do Gauss-Newton optimization where we take this very large but sparse Jacobian 
and, and then factorize it using, say, QR factorization. And then we, we, we get a square root uh, matrix, which is an upper triangular matrix, which really is the solution to the entire uh, problem. Uh, now, when you show these matrices, they, they make no sense. I mean, what, what, what is this matrix? What is that upper triangular matrix? It doesn't seem to have obvious structure. Um, and that's why factor graphs are so important, okay? They, they, they give you the, the structure of the problem. They show you what ordering heuristics might work, how you could maybe divide up the graph, how you can sparsify by merging uh, nodes and, and measurements. Um, sometimes they lead to new algorithms like pre-integration or, or iterative solvers on, on top of these. And then uh, what I'll talk about also is of course the base tree that is the work with Michael that became very popular. Um, one of the things in the drone space that we did uh, also in, in, in uh, collaboration with, with people at CMU um, was thinking about uh, multi-robot uh, mapping problems. So this is Alex Cunningham, he, he's now at TRI. Uh, and, and so one thing you can do with a, with a graph is break it up into multiple pieces and give each piece to a different robot in your swarm, okay? Um, but by far the most sort of influential work uh, in this space has been done by, by Michael and myself and, 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 uh, and some others at that time. Where where we we looked at this sparse you know upper triangular matrix, couldn't make sense of it. Read a lot of papers in graph theory and and um, and, and and machine learning and discovered okay that this upper triangular matrix is really uh, can be represented as a tree structure, uh, and that led to the the base tree uh, data structure, which which lies at the heart of ISAM and ISAM2, um, which are um, quite popular uh, uh, navigation um, algorithms now. So here's uh, the movie from back in 2012. This is with Michael and, and, and uh, all the co-authors on this. Uh, so let me let me just see whether I can uh, speed it up. So what you'll see, uh, and I've shown this many times, is that as you go through a, an environment, this base tree which is really that upper triangular matrix, but in graphical form, that base tree grows and grows and grows, but as the robot only sees an incremental amount of information each time step, we, um, we don't have to actually rebuild this entire tree. Um, and if you order it just so, then all the computation happens near the top of the base tree and only occasionally in, in SLAM when you make a loop closure, um, do you get uh, an, an appreciable uh, amount of computation? So, so this is really, uh, really powerful. Um, so ISAM2, we also coupled with a, with a very capable front end and, and, and cool sensors like inertial measurement devices. So another quite influential piece of work uh, is, is, is by uh, Forster and, and, and Carlone and it, done in my lab back in, in 2016, 2017 on pre-integrating IMU measurements and coupling that with, with ISAM. And at that time, at least we got uh, 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 the, the state-of-the-art uh, visual inertial uh, pipeline. And it is still quite popular because these factors that you know, uh, Christian and, and Luca uh, built and, and, and bundled with, with GTSAM are available for everyone. And they're quite sophisticated. Uh, it, it's hard to build on your own. Uh, Hence the popularity. Um, one of my uh, uh, new students, uh, Yetong Zhang, um, has worked with uh, it, at an internship at Facebook on extending um, uh, this this base tree work uh, that Michael did to multi robot scenarios. So so he has uh, created the uh, the multi robot uh, base tree. But uh, and so this multi robot base tree is is uh, is really cool. Um, but uh, the other thing that that is that is interesting is you can you can do you can even think about continuous representations for trajectories, and so this is work that um, really uh, people in, in optimal control have been thinking about for a long time. Uh, but also Tim Barfoot at um, at Toronto has has popularized sort of continuous time slam uh, representations. 
GT Sam supports Gaussian processes and, and Chebyshev polynomials since since uh, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, but we can easily support other representations like B splines, the wavelet decompositions are are other polynomial bases. Um, uh, another student that I work with is Varun Agarwal. Uh, he has uh, worked with Chebyshev bases, so Chebyshev is really the coolest thing ever. Okay, so Chebyshev polynomials are like the Fourier series on a circle, uh, but then flattened onto the midline. And so in effect, they, they are a Fourier series on a line segment. And of course, if you're doing work with trajectories in, in robotics, you have a trajectory from, from zero to T, and that's a line segment in time. And so I, I would argue that Chebyshev polynomial, sorry, in, in, in a way, the, the most natural basis in which to do um, at least polynomial expansions of, of continuous trajectories. Um, we took a, a leaf from um, uh, optimal control theory and worked with, with a pseudo spectral parameterization where instead of you know, specifying the weights of these bases as, uh, as the parameters to optimize for, instead you, you have a couple of key points on the trajectory uh, and the unique Chebyshev polynomial that goes through it is then the, the, the Chebyshev polynomial that you will use for the trajectory. So that's, that's not a spectral rep representation, but a pseudo spectral representation because you, you work with um, points that you interpolate. Um, and that is very intuitive. In fact, more intuitive than working with the weights of the base decomposition. So I encourage you to read uh, Varun's paper. Uh, this is an ICRA 21 paper. Um, where he applied it to quad rotor state estimation. Um, and with, with, in, in such a way um, that you could um, try to estimate what the unknown motor speeds were of the quad rotor. So it's a fully dynamics um, state estimator on, on quad rotors. Um, so um, I won't say too, too much more about that, except to say that I'm very proud that with, with my collaborators over, over the last um, more than 10 years, we've been working on GTSAM. Um, and you can read about it at gtsam.org or on, on the GitHub repo. It's fully uh, open source. It's BSD licensed. We have many collaborators that are, that are making PRs and creating issues. There is an active Google group. Um, it's C++, but there are very friendly Python and MATLAB wrappers that allow you to um, um, quickly get up to speed and try some things. Maybe in a collab, uh, you, you just uh, pip install GTSAM and, and you're up and running. Um, and, uh, and this is the last thing I'll say about perception. Last week, um, uh, Hilario Tomei, who is the, the one person behind Team Dynamo at the DARPA Subterranean uh, Simulation Challenge, won $750,000 with um, with an entry that was completely quadrotor based, uh, but was heavily leaning on GTSAM and ISAM2 uh, both uh, sort of GTSAM pulse-lam like things and ISAM2 um, visual odometry solution. Um, and, and his uh, software is, is just really impressive. Um, and he did a lot of other things building on top of GTSAM. I'm not claiming the victory is due to, to factor graphs and GTSAM, but the existence of GTSAM at least allowed him to jump um, and concentrate on, on hairy things like um, collaboration of multiple platforms, uh, mapping, and, and, and these things. So uh, you too can use GTSAM as a springboard uh, to have impactful work. Okay, Doc, so um, quick switch. Um, so this was all about perception. And I spoke very quickly because I've given uh, talks of this nature before. Um, and and uh, I also recently published a, um, a paper with Michael and then a, a paper at, at um, uh, Annual Reviews that, show, that talk a lot about the perception part and how other people have also picked up factor graphs uh, and it's become um, quite popular. And, 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 and so that's really great. What is maybe less 
well known is how to use factor graphs for action. And so the, the last three sections of, of my talk will be about trajectory optimization, optimal control, and then model predictive control. Um, and at one point I'll, I'll dive in quite deep because uh, that's what I've been told to do in a talk is uh, you know keep it general for a bit and then go really deep and then come back so that everybody can follow. And so maybe I'll lose some of you on the way, um, but this talk is available online. So um, depending on 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 uh, uh, you can you can watch it at twice the speed or half the speed, and uh, we'll we'll see where where we end up. So let's start with motion planning. Um, that's of course one of the key capabilities for autonomous systems, right? Be it manipulation, motion planning, um, be it uh, in in autonomous systems like the Skydio drone, or in this case the Waymo um, um, sort of road planner, or uh, motion planning for humanoids. Um, so in in all of these contexts and and many more, motion planning is is a key problem. And factor graphs turn out to be really an excellent framework in which to innovate in, in motion planning. You can, you can phrase the whole thing as a factor graph optimization problem, where you have factors that talk about the smoothness of the trajectory. You can add factors that are related to task objectives, like uh, obstacle avoidance, reaching a goal within a certain time. Um, they could be platform specific, like um, joint limits, um, or things like minimize jerk. If you are, if you have passengers, you don't want to jerk them around, hence or the, the, the term jerk. Um, and uh, some of the work that we did in this space, which is um, I, I think really cool, and I should really credit uh, Byron Boots and 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 the two students involved, Jing Dong and Mustafa Makadam. Uh, at the time, I was on leave, and and so I had regular meetings with them. But really, they 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 pulled that work uh, forward. Um, and this is the Gaussian process motion planning work, which where we um, frame motion planning as a probabilistic inference, uh, which is not a new idea. Um, Mark Toussaint um, has has written uh, extensively about planning as inference. Allows us to go to use all the machinery that we built in SLAM and then apply it in maybe an unexpected domain like motion planning. So, um, so what we do is we, we represent the uh, trajectory optimization uh, problem as a factor graph, which is now uh, has a Markov chain that encodes smoothness. These are the GP prior factors. Um, we have uh, unary factors on each uh, state along the trajectory um, that are connected to maybe a model of the environment, so you avoid obstacles. And then you have unary factors at the at the start and at the goal uh, to say what we want to, what our constraints are, where we start from, and, and where do we want to end up, right? And of course, GPMP two can use factor graphs on all the sparsity built into GPSAM. Uh, to efficiently solve a least squares problem. Um, and with GPMP2, we, we build a base tree, uh, and then we can use all the incremental SAM uh, work that Michael was so instrumental in uh, to build uh, motion planners that can be very quickly retargeted, maybe if the, the goal changes or something. So, so, so here are some results from that work where GPMP2, by virtue of using a fast sparse solver and factor graphs, is already beating out uh, at that time the leading trajectory optimization um, uh, methods, uh, including some from CMU, I, I apologize to say. Um, but then incremental GPMP2, by not having to recompute this entire solution, the, the, the base tree, when a new goal appears, um, is, is even an order of magnitude faster than, than the vanilla GPMP2. So, um, so that's that's interesting, right? That you that you can use all this technology built for SLAM um, and, and, and apply it in sort of these different contexts. Um, 
We also use factor graph motion-based planning to do fun things like robot calligraphy. When I came back to, to Georgia Tech, I, I, and I'm still very interested in, in arts with robots. Uh, we have a, a small uh, National Science Foundation grant in exploring both calligraphy and graffiti. And I'll, I'll talk about graffiti in, in, in a minute. Um, and so this, this robot, uh, this is a fetch robot uh, and it has a, a brush here. Um, and you can give it any Unicode character that represents a, a Chinese character. Um, I don't know what happens if you give it uh, any other script, like uh, we've not tried Korean or Sanskrit or something. So we really only evaluated on, on Chinese characters. And then the, the, the robots will, in fact, uh, because the Unicode already can index into a database on the, that gives us the strokes and the stroke order, which is very important when you when you write Chinese characters, um, and then we fit a Chebyshev polynomial using using uh, this uh, motion planning paradigm based on GTSM, and then execute it. Currently, still open loop um, on the uh, on the robot. We did switch to a different robot because the fetch is a is a great robot, um, but we were not able to have sophisticated enough motion planning to deal with the um, the vibrations arising from from the um, the rubber wheels so I, I think if we we push on this uh, we can actually compensate for that but we switch to a, a panda Franca panda robot for iris 20 results so this is work led by Sen Wang who is a master student at uh, Georgia Tech um, so this is one instance where we, we do robot manipulation. Uh, my student, Mandy Shi, um, actually went deep into modeling uh, both the kinematics, but also the dynamics of, uh, of robots. So um, where the recipe is, you take a, a, a book like the awesome book by Lynch and Park, uh, which is called Modern Dynamics. Um, I love this book because it's, it's, it's full of Lie groups and, and uh, six dimensional quantities, which, which to me is the modern in modern uh, robotics. Um, and we take all these six dimensional quantities and, and Lie groups, which are matched very well with the capabilities of GTSAM, where Lie groups and manifolds are, are, are the norm rather than the exception. And we build a factor graph representing the kinematics and dynamics of a robot arm. So this, this complicated looking factor graph here is really just expressing the dynamics of a two um, link arm. And if we don't have to stop at two links, of course, this is a, a, an example on how we can then do full kinodynamic motion planning. So here we have a robot that is doing weight lifting. And if I play this again, you'll see that just like a real weightlifter, there's a strategy to bring the weight closer to the body at first so that you do not exceed your joint limits uh, when lifting this, this weight up, right? So let me just play that again. All right, so first we bring the, the, the weight closer to the body before we really attempt to bring it up. Um, and that type of reasoning you can only do if you take into account uh, torques and wrenches and limits on torques that uh, the robot can deliver. Uh, one of the most sophisticated uh, applications that we tried is, is, uh, is uh, in collaboration with the ARM lab at Georgia Tech. We um, planned a, a jumping robot, the jump of a jumping robot that uses these uh, pneumatic muscles, um, where we had to model um, not only the trajectory over time, um, but we had to do this in a multi-phase way because in the, at first the robot is on the, on the ground and it is in contact with the ground and it can push off the ground, but then there is a flight phase in which you're, you're basically ballistic. Um, we had to also model the muscles, uh, the valve release and, and all of these things. So this was a fairly sophisticated, um, exercise and, and, and luckily with our colleagues in the arm lab, they had all the expertise about pneumatic muscles and pneumatic control. And so we're able to, to optimize for our jumps at different heights. And uh, 
while our simulation doesn't exactly match reality, so there is a reality um, a, a, a into a real gap, we're nevertheless able to, to plan and optimize for open loop um, trajectories that, that execute these jumps um, uh, flawlessly. Um, and, and this work isn't finished yet, so, so uh, keep watching that space. This is also an IRS-21 paper, um, if you would like to read more about it. Now, optimal control, this, this is where I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Um, and I want to thank my, my student, Jerry Chen, for creating a set of slides that, that will, um, will tell the story, OK? Um, and the story goes a little bit like this. So if, if you have a discrete planning problem, uh, like strips, OK, or you have a Markov decision process, which is very popular now in, in, in deep reinforcement learning, right? You can actually express this as a Markov chain over time with, with factors that indicate the initial states, um, factors that are connected to the states that in, indicate reward, uh, factors that can, can specify the cost of taking a certain action, and then dynamics factors, which in a, in a typical MDP is fairly, fairly, um, fairly simple, but in strips planning, for example, could take into account the, uh, the preconditions and the postconditions of, of, of taking a particular action. And so, so just this mind switch that you can represent these planning problems, in this case, in discrete state spaces, with a factor graph sort of makes you think, OK? Um, in particular, uh, you know, the, the, the go-to tool in, in, um, in factor graphs as an, as an algorithm uh, is elimination. And, and in, in, in a continuous uh, setting, this is a, factor, a matrix factorization algorithm, for example. Um, but in this discrete setting, uh, when we eliminate the last state and the costs associated with it, and then we eliminate the last action, what we get is a, an arrow, a directed basically graph here from, from state three to action three, which represents the optimal policy. So that arrow that you get after eliminating a single state is actually a policy. Um, and, and what is more, this, the factor that you get from, when you, uh, when you eliminate a factor graph, when you eliminate a single variable, you always get sort of a residual factor. And what happens is the factor transfers from state four to state three, and really combined with the factor that was already on S3, which, which has a reward on the state, these two factors, the sum of them is actually the value function. And so elimination from left, uh, from right to left, so from, from the end of times to the beginning of times, is in fact nothing more in an MDP than value iteration. Okay, so if we continue this, we get a directed acyclic graph. And at every location, we get a policy. And this is a finite horizon policy. OK, we, we, we do, um, you, you, could, you could think about sort of discount factors and make this infinite. Um, but, but uh, or just go back really, really far. And then it forgets uh, everything about S4. And so if you go back far back enough, then, then you will get a, a policy, which is, which is sort of an infinite horizon policy. But then you better discount, of course. So that's uh, you know um, the this arrow. You can also um, do the the other arrow. So if you if you actually eliminate from left to right, uh, and I won't go into detail here, but you you get a bit of a Dijkstra like algorithm uh, that expands from the gold state towards uh, from the start state to the gold state, and then you can even do elimination from the middle out. Uh, this might be a Silicon Valley uh, joke. But if you do middle out elimination, okay, you get basically Dijkstra and, and a policy that come together somewhere in the middle, which is which is very much like a bidirectional Dijkstra algorithm in, in, in discrete state spaces. So uh, that might seem a lot of, a little bit abstract, but um, I'm hoping that some of you have have a background in in control, and so 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 now I'll I'll, I'll give you the continuous story. So. 
if we switch to continuous spaces, then our state space is now a continuous vector. Uh, you know, it's in a vector space uh, denoted here by X. Um, in, in control uh, theory, it's, it's customary to, to denote the, the continuous control using U. Um, we, the, the, uh, the reward for being in a state or the cost for being in a state is, is, uh, is given by this, um, this um, quadratic uh, form with a covariance matrix Q. And similarly for the, for the cost we, uh, of, the, of the control, we have R, we have an initial state uh, constraint and we have in this case, a factor that encodes the linear dynamics of this linear uh, dynamics finite horizon LQR problem. Okay, it's linear. There's a Q. There's a R. Okay, it says quadratic regulator, but I like to you know, I like to think of Q and R as the Q and R here. So what happens if you eliminate this graph from from the end of times back to the beginning of time, right? Which is the trick we did in in ISAM and all these things. Well, you get a, um, you're, what you're doing is solving a dynamic Riccati equation, solving the finite horizon LQR problem. So again, just like in the discrete case, every one of these arrows is a policy, which is a controller uh, that says if you're in state X3, you better use this uh, time varying uh, control uh, gain matrix K to compute your control. And, and, and just as we had in a discrete case, there is going to be the factors that remain at every uh, elimination step is going to be the value of that state, but now it's going to be a value uh, which is a quadratic. Um, and so you recover LQR. On the GDSM uh, webpage, there is actually uh, a blog post that goes into excruciating detail with lots of beautiful simulations uh, or animations. Uh, so if you're interested in how this relates, uh, factor graphs related to LQR, um, this, this, this blog post by Jerry uh, and, and Yetong Zhang uh, is really great. Um, here's another collaboration with CMU. Once you take that view of having a factor graph that, that, that represents an LQR problem, then you can do crazy things like add a bunch of factors that you know, like equality constraints, like um, we would like a periodic solution to this LQR problem, or we have state dependent control limits, um, or, you know, um, any, anything you want that is an equality constraint, you can just add into the factor graph. And uh, this, is, this is work with uh, um, uh, Shou Yang and, and Javi Choset, and here is Yitong and, and Jerry again, so uh, who wrote the blog post. Uh, this is an ICRA 21 paper. And if you eliminate this graph, okay, so here's the elimination and thank you so much, Jerry, to, to create that animation. Now you get policies with gain matrices that depend on multiple states, okay? Um, so it's just such a nice uh, generalization of LQR. Um, so so I, I wanted to share that with you. Um, and then this is all still linear. But, but of course, uh, in graffiti, which is the next application that I'm going to talk about, we need actually nonlinear control. Uh, so you can do this in an iterative way. And, and iterative LQR um, is, 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 is known from a paper by, by uh, Emma uh, Todorov in, in 2005, um, but, but is, is based on, on work that dates back to the 1960s on, on differential dynamic programming in, in control. Um, but here's the way you do it with a factor graph, okay? I'm not saying we invented any new math. We did not. We're just representing Todorov and others' work in a, in a different, uh, in a graphical framework. So now we have our rewards can be nonlinear. Our state, our control costs can be nonlinear. Um, our dynamics, of course, is going to be nonlinear. That's the main advantage that we get from switching to a nonlinear framework. So, well, you create a nonlinear factor graph in GTSAN and you ask to linearize it, in which case you get a linearization of both the state dynamics and the uh, controls around a nominal trajectory. This is very much a linear LQR problem. So you solve that 
and you get a policy on the linearized dynamics. And you do this until convergence. Um, and now you have an open loop trajectory around which you have created a um, locally optimal, uh, but time varying controller. Okay. So, all right, so that's the deep part. I, I went a bit deep and I went quite fast because I have an eye on, on the clock. Um, but I want to sort of pop back up and show you what we did with this type of technology. Um, so, so you could ask all of this just to deface buildings, right? So yes, we are building a cable robot at uh, Georgia Tech. In fact, we built one we, whose main goal is to deface walls with graffiti. And, and uh, well, part of, the, of, our, of our goal is actually to get away from uh, graffiti as being associated with defacing, but, but see it as the art form that it is. Um, and, and bring this art uh, in, in, a, in, in sort of a STEM uh, um, context and, and, and helping to actually connect with uh, the very vibrant community in Atlanta, for example. So this is ATL for Atlanta um, of graffiti artists uh, that, we, that we partner with. Um, we did design, build and evaluate a cable robot. So it turns out we did some study and, and shows that you, you really need two meters per second velocity and 20 meters per second square acceleration. So um, here is Jerry's cable robot, okay? Um, and this is using um, iterative LQR um, to do the control for each of these uh, movements, right? And it's important that you have that LQR controller there um, because this is a highly nonlinear system. Um, and, and in the optimization process, you have to think about uh, the torque limits, uh, the tension limits, the fact that the cables must always have tension in them. You cannot push with the cable, you can only pull. Uh, so all of these things can be encoded in the factor graph framework. Um, so what we then did was actually, um, we worked with two graffiti artists, um, Max and Jules, and in, in true, true tradition, graffiti artists never show their face on camera. Um, so, but this, this, is, this is one of them in our mocap setup, uh, creating a letter. And so we had them spray paint the entire alphabet while, while we had mocap mark markers on, on a glove and, and the, the, the spray paint can. And then with um, a, a great team of students at, at Georgia Tech, we, we um, built a software, including the iterative LQR uh, factor graph to, to, um, to replicate and recompose these graffiti uh, letters in, in different combinations. And so this is our uh, graffiti robot in action. Um, and I was surprised how difficult this was. So this is really a kudos to the students involved. Um, cable robots are tricky and difficult to make work. And so we're, we're not there yet, um, but, but I'm sure um, we will get there in the end. But um, this is already, um, let me just scroll to the very end where I have the last uh, ATL. So, uh, and I think we might see Jerry and uh, is that Michael uh, give a high five. All right. So uh, on to the last stretch, which is uh, model predictive control. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop for questions. Um, both trajectory and motion planning are, are needed. Okay. So, so we, we need uh, trajectory estimation. What happened in the past? Where are we now? Uh, what are what is our current state? Our velocities, our accelerations. What are the wrenches exerted upon us? And they might not be what we planned for. So we need to do estimation together with control, right? And and so we developed a, a methodology called Steep, which is simultaneous trajectory estimation um, and planning. In this case, motion planning, where we build a single factor graph that has that switches as time progresses 
from state estimation to motion planning. Uh, so we keep moving this pointer. And we do this in a single factor graph um, uh, for convenience, uh, but you could also, uh, maybe a more principled way to, would be to do it in, a, in, in two factor graphs, one which, which grows and the other one which keeps shrinking. Um, but the principle is, 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 uh, is, is the same. Um, you know, at every time uh, we, we, um, we, we, we have uh, a, a tr estimated trajectory, which here is shown in red. Um, we have a planned trajectory. We execute the first step in that plan that is called model predictive control. It's, it's, it's where you plan a whole sequence, but then you only ever do the first thing of that sequence. And then you run GTSAM again to, to do the trajectory estimation part. And then you update your plan, okay, um, and and um, and repeat, right? Um, and here is a, a little movie that I've shown before, uh, where we have a, a mobile manipulator on um, wheels. Uh, they're, not, they're not regular wheels, though. They're these Swedish wheels on carpet, and everybody, anybody that works with Swedish wheels on carpet will will know that this is. Uh, so the re recipe for disaster, you know, your state estimation is very tricky. Uh, so this is where really steep came to its, uh, its, its uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was really successful there because it, it constantly re-estimated based on where we were in the environment and re-planned to then go and, and grasp a, a bottle of, I don't know, this yellow bottle. Um, so, this is work with uh, Mustafa again and Jing and then uh, Byron Boots uh, and this was at RSS 2017, but it's also a journal paper in, in 2018. We also applied STEEP uh, together with ILQR. So now we not only do motion planning, but envelop uh, a, a time varying ILQR controller in a satellite proximity operation application with, uh, with real spacecraft dynamics. And that was a collaboration with the uh, Dynamics and Control Systems Laboratory at Georgia Tech, where they have this amazing, like low gravity space simulator. Um, and this, the student here is, is Matthew King Smith, and, and uh, my colleague Panos Siotras is uh, the head of uh, the DC, DCSL. Um, and so here we, we, we do steep uh, and react to obstacles uh, close to satellites. So this is a uh, we evaluated this in the uh, hardware simulator. Uh, this will make a little bit of noise because uh, this is a full five degree freedom satellite simulator on the very uh, friction free floor, which is propelled by thrusters. Okay, so these are thrusters that operate with pulse width modulation. And so they are uh, uh, not, of course, completely faithful, but you know quite faithful simulation of how spacecraft uh, operates. Um, oh, I, uh, I wanted to show the movie here. Um, let's see. Yeah, so let me just press play here. So here we have, um, okay. Uh, unfortunately, it seems I can only sort of um, manually control it. So we have a, a robot that functions as the, um, the obstacle here, the robot arm, and then the, uh, uh, the, the satellite simulator completely plans its, its way around this using steep. Uh, and if it has advanced knowledge of this uh, trajectory of the obstacle, then it actually can, can plan something that minimizes fuel cost uh, while still always respecting uh, a, a good distance to the obstacle. And, and, and often in space, we actually have a knowledge of uh, debris uh, trajectories because everything is ballistic. Um, although, of course, we, we are also looking into maybe more game theoretic setups now where, where the obstacle, even in space, is uh, adversarial um, and, and hence can try to maybe actively avoid or actively collide with a particular satellite. So, uh, this is steep and uh, ILQR in a space uh, setting. So I covered why factor graphs. I, I revisited factor graphs being successful for perception. Um, and I talked mainly about what I think is, is uh, uh, 
a relatively unexplored uh, use of, of factor graphs in robotics. Uh, and I hope that this talk to convince more of you to look into that, uh, specifically in trajectory optimization, motion planning, uh, optimal control, uh, and model predictor control settings. So um, all of this work, uh, again, you know, lots of people worked on both perception over the years and in the last couple of years on the, um, um, uh, the action part. And so I guess I'll, uh, I'll stop here on this uh, graffiti uh, rendering of GTSAM uh, to take questions. Um, thank you so much, Professor Frank. This is very exciting. Um, we do have a lot of questions. Um, I guess we can get started with the uh, questions online and then uh, transition to um, in-person questions on Zoom. The first question was, um, I, I guess I'll probably start with this. So do you have any book suggestions uh, for beginners with uh, factor graphs? So like if, if someone wants to get started, so like any particular resources you would recommend? Uh, it's not a, a book as it is a um, extended journal paper, but the factor graphs for robot perception uh, uh, paper slash book that I wrote with Michael, uh, so this is uh, Del Arte and Case, uh, Factor Graphs for Robot Perception. Uh, I think that's a really great start. Um, if you want to see a lot of the applications uh, and that, that are our lab, but also many other labs have done with Factor Graphs in that space, there is this annual reviews um, uh, journal paper that just came out. And, and my, my Twitter handle is fdelart, and you can, it's a pinned tweet there. Um, other than that, I can also very much uh, uh, advocate for the Modern Robotics book by, by uh, Kevin Lynch and, and Frank Park. That's just a really sublime book um, to, to see about manifolds and tangent spaces and, and things like that in a robotics context. Yep, um, sounds good. Uh, and then one question was, um, so what is the difference between pre-integration of IMU measurements and direct integration and error propagation and error state filters? Um, I, I, they are very related. Uh, in, in a way, the pre-integrated IMU factor is, is, a, is, is a sort of a, maybe a modern view on, on uh, mechanization of IMUs and, and working in, a, in an error state formulation. Um, so, so, um, so think of, Think of it this way: if, if you want to do, you know, something with navigation with with, with IMUs, you can still go. Uh, people people in the sixties that came up with, uh, like Kalman, that came up with the Kalman filter, extended Kalman filters, and mechanization of IMUs, were very very smart. Um, they had to work with very limited computation. Um, they had to achieve really amazing feats of, of navigation uh, with a very problematic sensor, like, a, like a, an accelerometer um, and a gyro, which is a bit less problematic, but still. So all, all this math is still very valid. I, I think the pre-integrated IMU factor bottles up that math for you and allows, it, allows you to use it in a context with other factors that you might yourself write or you know, things like uh, LIDAR, uh, visual odometry, uh, smart factors, um, you know, mapping. So, so you can put it all together in one framework and, and, and make, make it, take advantage of that, that work that Luca and, and Christian uh, did in the pre-integrated IMU uh, factor. Mm -hmm. um, and that we had one question regarding the equality constraints in the factor graph, um, which you mentioned uh, uh, for control. So the question was, um, generally in cable robots, uh, most of the tension uh, constraints are tend to be inequality constraints. So how did you actually weave that into an factor graph? And yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so in the GT Dynamics repo, which is, which is, which is public, but still a bit ugly. So I, I, I'm not recommending you look at it just yet. Um, but we are building our own uh, interior point uh, optimizer. This, this is um, mostly Yetong Zhang who is working on that. Um, and, 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 and so we are really 
trying to look into constraint uh, optimization uh, more and more. Um, but I do want to say the following. GDSAM is, is, and, 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 uh, is often regarded as, as an unconstrained least square solver, and that's its most common setting. But in, in a way, um, when you're dealing with Lie groups, uh, like rotation groups and, and special Euclidean groups, or manifolds like a direction in space, which is not a group, but just a manifold, you're doing optimization on manifolds. And, and, and here I should probably mention another great two books, which is the book by Absil uh, and, and, and his co-authors on, on optimization on manifolds and the more recent book by Bumal, uh, which came from a course he gave at, at uh, Princeton. Um, Manifolds are constrained spaces in an ambient space. So GTSAM is full of constrained optimization. Every optimization we do in GTSAM that involves any manifold of any kind is really doing constrained optimization, except it's not doing using a general uh, constrained optimization solver like IP opt or snopt. It, it's using the constraints inherent to the manifolds and the, the, the concept of a retraction or an exponential map to stay on that constraint manifold. So in a way, we've been doing constrained optimization all, all that time. Uh, it's just if you want more generality, you might have to go to, to things like interior point methods or, or sequential quadratic programming. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, we can take some questions from Zoom. So if anyone is interested, uh, please go ahead. So Frank, if I can ask you a question, this is Howie. Yeah. Yeah, first, this, this is a great talk. Thanks for uh, having it. And, you know, really, there's lots of lots of discussion points in here that I'd like to follow up with you. But let, let me ask this one question. And keeping in mind that, you know, I'm one of the, I'm one that converted, you know, I, I really, I, I just love this formulation and I'm trying to use it in the things that we do here. Um, but I have a question. Um, in all the applications that you've, you've done this for, have you thought about or uh, considered when the robot you know, makes contact with the environment and then breaks contact, but, but not in a rhythmic way, like a, a, a gate-based locomotive, but something more like a deliberate, I'll put my foot here, then I'll put my foot there, and, and so forth. Um, I personally have been doing a lot of thinking about contact. Uh, and in fact, uh, I mean, I think I shared this with you before. I've actually done a little GTSAM experiment to, to, to do... Uh, you know, snake uh, navigation in sand and all these things. So, so you, you can do these things that uh, confirm conformational changes, et cetera, as well. Uh, but for deliberate contact, that is um, hard, right? <laughs> right, right, right. That, that's um, what I'm asking. Yeah. And uh, that to me is, is, is one of the, the coolest frontiers um, in thinking about discrete continuous optimization problems and how to um, make continuous motion planning work together with a discrete contact plan, say, or gate, gate planning, or, or, or um, and, and lots of people do that uh, now in the legged robotics uh, community, et cetera, by using um, cool things like complementary, uh, complementarity constraints and, and, and then letting the solver do everything and pretending that everything is continuous. I'm, I'm in more in the camp, I guess, of trying to explicitly reason about this. Like, let's see what we can do explicitly reasoning about where we will apply contact and then solve the continuous problem as a sub problem. Uh, so I've been looking a lot at, at the, the cool work that done at MIT and other places like, like Rice on, on TAMP um, which is task and motion planning, which has that flavor of embedding continuous motion planning in, in a discrete search space. Um, so that's where I, my headspace is at, but, but I also recognize that there are many uh, sophisticated optimization techniques that can deal with it maybe in one framework, um, like you know, what POSA does in, 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 this, uh, in this space. Okay, well, th well thank you. I also apologize. I'm going to go away at 2.30, so I apologize. I'm missing your questions, but I hope we have a chance to talk later. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. 
Sure, you're you're continuing the tradition of of my co-authors asking me questions. <laughs> um, we have another question. Uh, oh, okay, good, good. Yeah. Uh, hi, Frank. Thanks for showing our picture there. I, I really it's an honor to be appeared in your presentation. Uh, my 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 question is actually recently I'm re reading some uh, new works like Andrew Davidson mentioned about. The future of SLAM could be using GPU to parallel the uh, computation for factor graph. I was wondering, are you also looking in this direction? What's your uh, opinions, comments on using GPU for parallel computing of factor graph? I think Andy will tell you that he's not looking so much to GPUs as has this uh, graph core architecture where we're really, you know, it's, it's like completely networked. We yeah. have looked at, uh, and Andy knows this and, and cites that work. Um, but with uh, Anand Ranganathan, back in 2008, we looked at loopy belief propagation to solve SLAM problems. It was, it was a, a paper that we daringly called Loopy SAM, okay? Or Loopy uh, is an endearing English term. Um, so the conclusion that we then made was, well, sparse, solvers just you know are tremendously better than this loopy belief propagation so you might as well deal with the sparsity and the exact factorization rather than deal with the loopy belief propagation which is an approximation but but i do think that andy is onto something that computation ar architectures evolve all the time and what worked yesterday on the pre predominantly cpu architecture might not be the right answer if you consider more graphical um, uh, distributed um, computation architectures. And so the work he did on, on doing structure from motion, bundle adjustment with, with loopy belief propagation on a graph core processor is really cool. And so, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, okay, so um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's good to see you again here virtually. Um, we have one more question from Peng. Um. Uh, hi, Professor Frank. Uh, I have just uh, one question. So I have one question for the DSM. So I, uh, we know DSM doing lots of uh, fast graph and also the can doing can deal with local core detections. So I'm thinking about uh, is there potential for the DSM handle the temporal difference, which means the robot may be revisit the same place for multiple times. Maybe a lot, it's like a long life slam. So you are always revisit the same place and you're adding a bunch of uh, uh, local detections, but the observation are always changing. So in that case, within the fat graph, is there any direction, any trend we can deal with this problem? Yeah. Um, well, I have not done a lot of work in this area with my students, but, um, but Michael Case has, and, and, and Ryan Eustis at, at uh, Michigan, um, they've worked on sparsification over long time periods because, yeah. because one of the issues is that, you know, after a while, uh, your computation becomes untenable and then, and then you're faced to where to make approximations, right? Hmm. Um, ISAM2 may be a little bit underrated in, in that sense because it, it turns out ISAM2 creates a base tree that is pointed from the, from the present to the past. And in fact, you don't have to keep the whole thing in memory all the time. You can just write the old base tree to disk and only swap it in when you need it. Now, okay. when you loop, close a loop, you might be faced with some computation, but after the computation, you're back in an incremental mode and you can, you can, you can swap everything back to disk. So, uh, so even the exact computation with ISAM, um, might be tractable, uh, although although you know in the papers that Michael and 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 and, uh, and Ryan sort of wrote, they they compare with ISAM and say, you know, sparsification is much much better. Um, so, yeah, that type of um, that type of paper is really cool and and interesting uh, as well. Okay. Um, I guess we can take one more last question and then, uh, yeah. Uh.
Hi. Uh, hi, Professor uh, Frank Dada. Uh, I have a question. So maybe it's a more toward to the engineering skill. So actually, when we try to fuse the multiple factors in the optimization problem, uh, uh, my question is how to balance the factors uh, during the joint optimization problem, because I think it's must be related to the coherence metrics, but sometimes maybe it's really difficult to adjust the coherence between the factors. So is there some advice to get us to uh, uh, achieve this more uh, easier? Yeah, thank you. Gotcha. Um, yeah, this was my biggest fear that I would be asked questions about bugs in GT Sam. It's like, hey, you know, whether you're going to solve this issue or that issue and, and, and provide real-time support here um, on the air, which I can't. But um, typically, yes. So, so another way to look at factor graphs and, and GTSAM is as a sensor fusion framework. Um, you have information from one source, which has a particular covariance associated with it, and information from another source uh, with another covariance matrix. And then you have all the knowledge that you got from the past so when you fuse these, you have to do it in the optimally weighted way by taking into account these different covariances. Um, where do these covariances come from uh, is not arbitrary. It's you have to model your sensor. You, mm -hmm. um, and one of the most difficult things to do is, is model um, you know, things like an inertial measurement unit that, that's hairy and you have to calibrate it and you have to do certain motions with it and, and things like that. But, uh, and, and you have IMUs of varying cost and performance. You just have to know your sensors. Uh, GDSAM is really a, a, an optimization framework that allows you to do the sensor fusion, but, but it cannot do any of the reasoning that you need to do, any of the expertise that you need to bring in the front end. So, so, okay. so, so that's what you bring and we'll do the optimization for you. Okay. Um, okay. Got it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess we can stop over here uh, since you're already running over time. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Frank, for this awesome session. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Yeah. Thank you, Nikhil and, and the Air Lab uh, to, for organizing this. Um, and um, it was it was great to be able to talk about my work. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah.